Father God, we just come in the name of Jesus, Spirit of the Living God. Right now, oh God, the soil of our heart. Yes, Lord. Teach us the spirit of truth. We ask that you would teach us your truth tonight. Yes, Lord. Oh, spirit of revelation. To us tonight, reveal your secrets to us, God. That we need to know. We fall at your feet. And we say we are. want to hear from. from me. Yes, Lord. Jesus. Yes, Lord. Teach us. Talk to us. Touch us. Heal us, oh God. We just surrender. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Thank you, God. We just turn over this meeting into your hands. Yes, Lord. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Welcome, sisters, daughters, everybody. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> it's so good to be together again because we did not meet. I met with the fresh men. Uh, we had a powerful time with them last month. And I know we meet um our meeting because of the snow in Dallas, right? That was what happened. Yeah. That was what was going on. Yes. Yeah, so it's so good to be reconnecting again. So um I see Oscar is here from the UK. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Oscar. Hats off to you. <laughs> I know you out there. The Lord bless you and reward you for your sacrifice. Amen. Amen. Okay, Amen. family. We're gonna um we're gonna start a school of deliverance. That's what we're gonna be talking in the next few sessions. So um I just wanted to take some time this year in the beginning to just teach some more about that. You know, I really feel that I know some of you, like um, Minister Valerie, Minister Fia, they're leading intercessory prayer. Minister Star, Minister Vera leading us in worship. There's just so many connections with that and and the ministry of deliverance. So the Lord was just laying in my heart to just go a little bit further with that teaching. So that's what we're going to do today. Let me pull up my notes. <laughs> okay. So I want to start by us just dialoguing a little bit because when we talk about deliverance, 
I know that it brings up all thoughts and and even fears <laughs> for many people. Um, so we want to, and you know, as Christians, we shouldn't be afraid of anything. If we are afraid, then there is a, a problem that we need to address. So, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of churches or ministries would just avoid even talking about deliverance and demons and evil spirits and all of that. But we cannot box it to a corner because it's whether we like it or not, we're born into warfare, right? We are born into warfare. Jesus was born into warfare. He was supposed to be killed um, right from the start. So Jesus's life speaks to our own lives as well. You know, he's our model. And he was not exempt from spiritual warfare. That tells us that we will not be exempt. As a matter of fact, the more we want to hide from it or run away from it, the more we are restricted in our ability to live our full potential as believers, as ministers, as sons of God. So it's important that we address it and whatever fear is there, we're going to deal with it. So let me start by asking, um, what is deliverance to you? Let's just talk a bit before I really get into the teaching aspect of, of tonight. Let me just hear from each of you briefly. What is deliverance to each of you? I think deliverance is being set free from the works of the flesh or deposits of darkness that come into our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. How do you feel about it? How do I feel about it? In what sense? Like, is it necessary or? When, when you think of yes, how do you feel? Uh, I, no, I think it's necessary. I think it's good because we need it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have any. Mm -hmm. Are you comfortable with it? Yes, I'm comfortable with deliverance. Okay. For yourself? Or are you comfortable watching others being delivered? So for myself, I think I grew up uh, <laughs> having a lot of deliverance sessions. Mm -hmm. So, and also it's something that I personally pray about every day for deliverance. So I, I, I don't have any discomfort towards it, either seeing other people being delivered or in myself going through any form of deliverance thing as part of our journey. Amen. Okay, thank you. Amen. Let me see. I think um, Minister Fia has been sharing something. She says, God, she says um, <clears throat> freedom from captivity and bondage of any form. That's correct. It is absolutely necessary to live righteously. Correct. So everything that all of you are saying is all part of it. So let's see who else have we not heard from. Okay, it looks like Sister Gail wants to share something. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I've been studying prayer probably since October, November. Mm -hmm. And probably a couple of weeks ago, God just sat me down and opened up the Lord's prayer to me. And one thing that jumped out at me was deliver us from evil. Mm -hmm. that that's part of the Lord's prayer. And that's something that we are to pray and that it's not necessarily, I don't know, you can speak to this, something we're to do for ourselves, but it's something that we need to ask for, that God has to reveal it, and he is the deliverer. Mm -hmm. But that just jumped out at me, and I don't know that that's ever jumped out at me before about the Lord's Prayer, but wow. we are to ask for deliverance. Amen. specifically amen I, I guess the lord was knowing that we were going to be getting into this he was starting to highlight it was becoming a rhema for you and for those who know actually the only person who probably know here is valerie may remember when i first started doing deliverance in dallas in the hotel in irving the title of the program i was was i still have those flyers somewhere if, like if you go scroll down my facebook pictures it was called deliver us from evil so exactly what gail is saying yes 
So the Lord's Prayer actually, the fact that Jesus takes the time to include that line. There was only a few lines he put in that prayer to teach us how to pray. One of it is deliver. Mm-hmm. That speaks volumes. <laughs> that tells us that there is going to be evil that will hold us captive that we're going to need to be delivered from. And then the how is more of what we're going to be talking about as we, you know, in the next few sessions. So thank you so much for that contribution, um, Gail. Who else has not shared something? I would like to say something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm so glad that it's called deliverance because any other place I've heard freedom classes but it's not the same because when you read your bible there's no like freedom classes but there is deliverance (laughs) you're so right yeah and and i remember uh so many times somebody would be telling me oh you're acting just like your dad or you're just like your mom and then it occurred oh those are those spirits that they may have had that were passed on to me Mm -hmm. past iniquities but deliverance (laughs) makes much more sense to me than freedom it's more of a truth Mm -hmm. wow thank you for that contribution linda oh my goodness you know when i came i remember when i came to church here in dallas to our church i also they, I noticed they use the word freedom. And yeah, you know, de- the, de- the process of deliverance brings us into freedom, right? But I, you know what I've learned? A lot of churches, I, I think it's part of the avoidance of, they f- mo- there's many pastors who feel like if we use the word deliverance, it scares people, people are going to run away. Oh, friends. Mm-hmm. So freedom is a little softer. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And so the, the word freedom is a little softer. And so many people um, prefer to just Accept use Accept it more, yeah. Yes. But freedom is such a broad word that when you, when you just say freedom, yeah, yeah. it's not really talking about, you know, deliverance, deliverance mm-hmm. or, or deliver us from evil as the yeah. Lord's prayer says. So thank you for bringing that up, Linda. Um, I think now we have Minister Oscarin who has not shared anything yet. Anything? Uh, I think that uh, about a year ago, if you had told me that I needed deliverance, I would have just asked you from what? Mm -hmm. Because I was never taught that I've been in church for, for a long time. Nobody has ever They've never thought about deliverance. Huh. Nobody has ever told me that I needed that. Yeah. And one time when I went to, I, I just went just to please somebody that they said, oh, you need deliverance. Come with me. I'll take you. And I went there. I had, I, I had a really bad experience. <laughs> and, uh, from that moment, I promised myself that I'll never let anybody put their hands on me again. Yeah. Even pray for me again. If if I, I don't know them, I'll never do that again. And it was a scary process for me because God has spoken to me and he told me that don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. If you don't know somebody, don't let them put their hands on you or pray for you. So I'm glad that I uh, I came to T2 to know that I needed I needed deliverance. Because before that, I was just like, <laughs> from what? <laughs> you know, if you need to be delivered, you go ahead. I don't. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you all for those contributions. Let me ask some more questions. Let's just talk about a, little, a few more things. Um, bear with me. So... <laughs> Let's talk about how you feel. A- anybody here, does anyone here have a fear? I mean, Os- Oscarine just shared about how she felt because of the experience she had. Is anyone amongst you afraid? Do you feel fear when deli- if, if you were present and deliverance was happening as in the casting out of devils? 
that aspect of deliverance. Let me just say that's just one aspect of deliverance. And we're going to teach more about that, that, you know, the deliverance is not just casting out of devils, but when you think about that aspect of deliverance, does anybody here feel fear? Or do you Mm-hmm. <clears throat> okay okay so let me let me read this from this is an excerpt that i pulled from online it says jesus uses the word ekbalo in matthew as a greek word ekbalo in matthew 9 38 where he begs his disciples to pray to the lord of the harvest to send forth as into ekbalo laborers into the harvest field. Ekbalo is not the normal term used for scent. As most of our translations have it, it is a spiritually violent word filled with passion and force. It is the same word that Jesus uses when he says, if I cast out. So ekbalo is the casting out of demons. That's just one aspect of deliverance. He says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So for the kingdom of God to come upon you, there is a connection with the casting out of devils, right? There must be ekbalo. You cannot really fully experience the kingdom of God without that. It goes on to say the authority and the force of Jesus casting out demons is the same spiritual force and authority by which he thrusts forth laborers. So for you to even be birthed into your, 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 um, your calling, your destiny, right? Jesus is using this word in relation to sending forth laborers, sending forth Gail, sending forth Linda, sending forth Oscarine. For him to send us forth, it's it's a thrusting right and that's the reason why you see for all of us to actually be birthed into our our different callings and ministries it doesn't just happen the enemy resists it and it's going to take that force that spiritual pushback that contention for us to be able to really walk in our callings so deliverance is not something that we can just you know cast to the side It goes on to say, the gospel of Mark says, and the spirit drove as in ekbalo him into the desert to be tempted by the devil. You see, they're using the word ekbalo again, where Jesus is about to encounter the devil in the desert. It seems as if the power and the resistance of Satan and his evil spirits must be confronted by a greater forcefulness and empowerment. When Jesus ekbalos demons, demons must leave. So it's, it's just such a powerful word. So to the point that Linda was making, I mean, personally, I feel like freedom is not sufficient. Freedom does not really, and, and if you do, anybody who has done deliverance as in the casting out of demons knows that it's not just something where you just, you know, you just lightly just get free. The enemy resists, right? The Bible says that resist the devil and he will flee from you. He doesn't just flee without you resistance. That tells you that there's going to be warfare. There's going to be confrontation. So you must use that force that, you know, there must be ekbalo, that passionate, forceful ejecting of the evil spirits. Okay, so let's talk about, I want to start by just, saying that, and those of you who followed um, the teaching that I did last week for the women in Canada, I believe I quickly mentioned the fact that, you know, we can break deliverance for the purposes of what we're going to be studying today, three parts. The first part is salvation. So when I, when I use the word deliverance, I'm not just talking about the casting out of devils, right? But that is really the picture that most people have when we talk about deliverance. So I just wanted to start by making it clear to say deliverance is a package deal. Deliverance is a part of our inheritance in Christ Jesus. It begins with salvation. Salvation is deliverance. So turn with me to Acts 4.12. It says, nor is there salvation in any other For there is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be 
saved, right? So we must be saved. What are we being saved from? Anybody? When you come to Christ, right? When you, when you first have salvation, what are you being saved from? Eternal death. Mm -hmm. Sin. Mm -hmm. And its consequences. Right. Anybody else? Anybody wants to add anything to that? Hell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. You know, eternal damnation, hell from the devil, from the kingdom of darkness, from, you know, we were, the Bible said he, he took us out of darkness, right? Into his marvelous light. That is the salvation experience, right? Mm -hmm. Just, we gave the, the keys to the enemy in the garden of Eden. And now Jesus came to take it back, right? The Bible says that he went and he took it from them and made a show of them and made a spectacle of them. So that is the salvation story. That's really what it is. Because we gave the keys away, Jesus had to come and take that and give it back to us. So when we are being saved, we had come under the authority of the kingdom of darkness before we come to Christ, right? We are walking in darkness. So the first phase of deliverance is Christ saving us from the kingdom of darkness where eternal damnation like you know you rightly said so if you are not delivered from eternal damnation you can't even get anything else in christ right so our journey with jesus begins with deliverance that process of you accepting christ is deliverance where he has reached out and he has pulled you he's pulling you out of darkness it happened forcefully. When you think of the word ekbalo, how, how did Jesus do that? There was contention, right? Think of his life on earth when he came to, to save us. There was contention the whole time that he walked on earth. There was contention when he went to the cross. Everything leading up to him going to the cross and him dying, there was contention. When he died, there was still contention. Because that's when he went and, and made a spectacle of the devil. That was still contention. So the whole process is contention. And we need to get comfortable, not just as believers, but even more so as ministers. We need to get com com comfortable with that contention. We need to understand that you come into the kingdom of God with contention. That's how we get saved. We, we may not physically see it. You may have just stood in a church and just said, oh, I, uh, oh, oh Lord Jesus, forgive me. I accept you of my Lord and Savior. If I, I'm confessing with my tongue, blah, blah, blah. You know what we say, right? The, the, the salvation confession. You may just have stood someplace and confessed it, but you did not understand what has happened in the spiritual realm. How much the enemy even tried to prevent you from going to the church that day right? The battle that was going on for your soul behind the scenes. So in order for you to get to a place where you are willing, think of all the people who, you know, all the, the sinful things that we, we, were, we may all have been involved in before we got saved, for us to come to a place where we were convinced that we had to leave that behind, how much the enemy contended for our souls to keep us in darkness, so the first phase of deliverance is salvation itself. It's a battle. If it was not a battle, if it was not deliverance from evil, guess what? All of our family members would be saved. All of our friends would be saved. All of our coworkers would be saved. But why is it that they're not all saved? Because it's a battle. There is contention for their souls. The enemy does not want to let them go. And so it takes deliverance it takes a delivering power of jesus to pull us out of that pit to pull us out of darkness and bring us into his marvelous light so i wanted to start by saying that salvation is deliverance and it comes with uncountable benefits one of which is the casting out of devils because when you come into the kingdom after that first phase of deliverance it's not over 
the enemy continues to still contend with you, right? So now you have defeated him through Christ by being able to confess <laughs> that Jesus is Lord. But it's not over. The battle continues. So in order to understand deliverance, we must first understand that we are bound. We are bound from the very beginning. We were bound before we accepted Jesus. And even after we accepted Christ, there are still aspects of bondage in our lives that have not been dealt with. So we need to understand that there is a need for us to be delivered from, you know, from all of that. And we are unable to deliver ourselves, right? We cannot do it ourselves to the point that uh, Gail was making, where, where the prayer says, deliver us, asking the Father to deliver us, right? So we are delivered from eternal death through Christ, through the death of Christ on the cross and the shedding of his blood. So now we begin to understand the instruments of deliverance. So deliverance does not just happen just because you stood there and said a few words. It's way deeper than that, right? It comes through the death of Christ on the cross, through the gruesome death and through the shedding of his blood. So we begin to understand that the blood is the weapon for deliverance. We cannot talk about deliverance and not talk about the blood. We also begin to learn that Jesus is our deliverer. And when the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is our helper, we also now understand as New Testament believers that Jesus is no longer physically here. So the Holy Spirit must help us through that process, right? Because the father, yes, he taught us how to say, you know, our father who art in heaven, right? We are addressing our prayers to our father. But Jesus has already given us all authority. The father has endorsed the transference of authority through Christ to us. So to speak to what Gail brought up, yes, it happens through the father, but that authority has been translated to us, which is why when you watch me, for example, doing deliverance on somebody, I'm not praying to the father at that point. I am using the, the power and the authority that has been given to me. At that point, I'm commanding because I understand that the authority has been given to me. So I'm not going to stand in front of a demon and begin to pray to the father at that point, right? It goes on to say, let me, these are based on the notes that I put together. This explains why the three most powerful tools in deliverance are the name of Jesus. So again, if you've watched me do deliverance, I, I keep saying in the name of Jesus, you know, come out in the name of Jesus. Right? That's one of the things I do. So we have to use the name of Jesus. We have to use the blood of Jesus. Right? So sometimes you hear me saying, I apply the blood. I apply the blood. I apply the blood. The blood is against you. The blood is against you, devil. Come out in the name of Jesus. Right? The next thing is understanding the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if we don't understand the power of the Holy Spirit, then we cannot do deliverance effectively as in the casting out of devils effectively. Okay, what is all of this saying to us? The second aspect of deliverance is, we said the first one was salvation. The second one is the word of God. So if you don't have the word of God in you, if you're not filled with the word, if you don't understand how to use the word, then you also cannot do deliverance. Because when we look at Matthew 4, right, and Jesus' experience in the wilderness, how did Jesus overcome the devil? It was with the word, right? What did Jesus do in order for the devil to leave him? So as ministers, whether you're in the worship ministry, helps ministry, you know, teaching ministry, whatever type of form of ministry, it's important that we understand this because at some point in your life, you will encounter the need to exercise this authority. How did Jesus, you know, if somebody's standing in front of you, right, and they are demonized, how do you get the devil to leave them? If the devil is oppressing even you, yourself, 
How do you get him to leave you? I know a lot of times in the church, we mainly think of, we have the picture of a minister shouting the come out in the name of Jesus. But before we get to the come out in the name of Jesus, let's just look at how, what Jesus did to cause the devil to leave him alone. He simply applied the word, right? So it's not even in the tone of our voice. Because some, many times people wonder and say, okay, you may tell the demon to come out and he doesn't come out. And you're wondering what is causing another person to say it and, and he comes out. As we go through this school of deliverance, we're going to talk about those kinds of issues so we can understand, right? But I love Jesus' example in Matthew 4 because he simply just like conversationally applied the word. And he applied the word. The Bible says that, and then the devil left him for a season. So that tells us right there that you, first you're saved. But next, you must know the word and understand the word. And that's one reason why we emphasize the word, the reading of the Bible daily, because it's in that word, in you understanding the word, in you having a revelation of the word, that you begin to understand the power that is in the word. And that's why you, 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 know, you can just talk very calmly and still apply the word effectively in the casting out of devils. Now, the power of the word applies to each of our lives before you even get to a point where you, you, you can even begin to think about casting out demons from somebody else. How do you even get set free of your own bondages? You are washed by the word, right? The more you soak yourself in the word, the more the enemy flees from you the more you can confess the word over your own life. There are many bondages that will fall off of your life without you bringing a pastor or a prophet to come command the demon to, to let you go by you just learning the word and speaking the word over your own life. So those are the tools, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit. But the only way for you to understand these things is by understanding the power in the word. Amen. So deliverance is possible in the name of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit is sometimes referred to as the fire of the Holy Spirit, which is why, again, if a, if a regular person is just saying fire, right? If you just walk around in your house and you're just saying fire, demons are not necessarily coming out and go and leaving your house. They're not. We all use the word fire a lot of times, right? In, a, in our regular daily speech we use the word fire demons don't just run every time we use the word fire what makes the difference when we're talking about deliverance it's always about what revelation do you have of the word so unless you have a revelation you can shout fire all you want and nothing will happen but when you have the revelation and that's why we take the time to teach that the holy spirit brings fire so when you understand that hebrews 12 29 says for our god is a consuming fire i've heard people say oh why do people just shout fire during deliverance but the bible says that god is a consuming fire so when you are saying fire 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 and you're just saying that one word over a demonic situation what you are saying is Holy Spirit, God, you are a consuming fire. Let your fire consume this darkness. So in one word, when you have the revelation, that one word is loaded. And that's the reason why when you have the revelation, the enemy knows who has the revelation and who does not. So when you're, when you're applying the word fire, you are calling on God. If we take it back to what, uh, Sister Gail said earlier, God deliver us from evil. God, you are a consuming fire. You don't necessarily stand in front of the demonized person and begin to pray to Abba Father in that manner. But by you just saying fire, 
In other words, you're saying, Father God, I know you are a consuming fire. Release your fire over this darkness. Consume everything that is not of you, that is in my life, or that is in the life of this person that I am praying for. So the Holy Spirit is a fire. God the Father is a fire. Jesus is a fire. Amen? Now, Leviticus 6, 8 to 13. I want to connect that to what we're talking about. Because as ministers of God, we must carry that consuming fire. If you don't carry the fire, you will never be able to do deliverance effectively, not on yourself, not on other people. So I want us to talk about the fire. The Holy Spirit is a fire and he must burn in us continually. And that's why if you don't stay in the place of reading the word, if you don't stay in the place of consecration, if you don't stay in the place of praying continually, men ought to pray continually. If you don't stay in the place of fasting, if you don't do those things, if your life is dry, right? You just pray once in a while when you need something. If your, if your prayer life is weak, if your, your Bible study life is weak, if your fasting life is weak, you will not be able to maintain the level of fire that you need in order to overcome the darkness in your own life and in the lives of those that you are praying for. If you're building a ministry, if God is, is building a ministry through you, you're going to end up with a weak ministry where people are suffering with all kinds of things, all kinds of things are happening and you feel powerless. You cannot help them. You cannot even help yourself. So it's not sufficient for us to just have, you know, on and off prayer life. We, it, we must consistently remain in that place where we are eating of the word. We are praying, we are in front of God. We are continually in his presence. We are continually fasting. That's why you're going to notice a lot of pastors who do deliverance live a fasted life. You cannot live a casual life. You cannot be the kind of pastor that lives a casual life because you will not have the fire. You will not be effective in ministry. So Leviticus 6, 8 to 13 says, the Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons this command. These are the regulations for the burnt offering. The burnt offering is to remain on the altar, on the altar hearth throughout the night till morning, and the fire must be kept burning on the altar. Now, I wanted to share this verse with, with you ladies because the other thing that must happen if you're going to walk in that anointing to be able to do deliverance is that these are the regulations of the burnt offering. You must become an offering, right? I talk all the time about us be being living sacrifices. You and I must be a living sacrifice. We cannot have the kind of life that a lot of people out there, you know, people who maybe they live and they, they get away with sin in their lives. We can't live like that. Because you must be that sacrifice. For the, for the fire to come on the altar, there must be a sacrifice on the altar. And we're not talking about altars made of brick or stones or wood. When we talk about altars in the new dispensation, we're talking about an altar of prayer, an altar of consecration. Your life must be that sacrifice or the so-called burnt offering. It's about us. The burnt offering is to remain on the altar. So you are to remain in the place of prayer. You are to remain in the place of worship. You are to remain in the place of studying the word, in the place of, you know, continually coming before God. It says throughout the night. So not just when it's comfortable. What is the night? Throughout your dark seasons, throughout your easy seasons, you're not going to say, oh, you know what? Oh, uh, in the last season, I, will, I, I asked God for some things he didn't give me. 
my life fell apart. So I'm going to stop praying. I'm not going to believe anymore. You know, my prayer life has gone cold because I'm disappointed that God did not do something that I was asking him. No, 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 no. You must remain that sacrifice on the altar throughout the night till what? Till the morning. It's only you must ride the night until the light comes in whatever situation. You cannot say, oh, I'm tired of praying. I'm tired of reading the word. I don't see any results. You must remain burning on that altar. And it goes on to say, and the fire must be kept burning on the altar. This is how we remain in a place where we carry the fire of God. The, the priest shall then put on his linen clothes with linen on the garments next to his body. And I'm, I'm not going to go into that part because that part to what I'm trying to explain today, I'm not going to break that part down. And shall remove the ashes of the burnt offering that the fire has consumed on the altar, right? The fire will consume the offering on the altar. So the fire starts by consuming you. The fire is going to burn us first. So I say all the time that anybody who is going to be used in deliverance ministry, you have got to be burnt first. What are the things in your life that must be placed on the altar? What are the weaknesses in your life? What are the sinful ways in your life that must be placed on the altar and for allow the fire to burn it? That must happen with us first. Because one of the reasons why some people are not able to do deliverance is because the things in your own life have not been burned first. And so when you try to give a, a command to the devil, he doesn't listen to you. Right? Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, right? And who are you? So you must allow that fire to burn you first and purge you first and cleanse you first. And carry the ashes outside the camp to a place that is ceremonial, ceremonially clean. You must come to that place where you are clean. The fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Your fire cannot go out. If your fire goes out, the, the devil will roast you alive. He will. If you try to dabble in deliverance, he will roast you. So you're going to find that for us to do deliverance, we have to live the kind of lives that most people will look at you and say, oh, why are you behaving like this? Are you the only pastor out there? How come other pastors do like this or they do like that? And you're saying you can't do that. You need to understand. There was a day that my husband and the kids, they, were, they, were, they, they always, they, they go to the movies sometimes and they know that I don't like to go there. And I tell them that the, the, the movie theater is, is packed with demonic things, right? I, there's all kinds of demonic things in there. And even watching certain kinds of things on TV, and I said, I, and they'll tease me. And I said to them, no, I, I just can't. <laughs> I just cannot. So what am I trying to say? If you're going to be effective in deliverance ministry, it's going to call for a high level of consecration. You may not even fit even within the body of Christ. You may look odd. You may look different. You may look like you're exaggerating. You may look like you're a fanatic but you must be kept clean. You cannot dabble in the things that some, all these pastors who sleep with people and they do all those things and they still come and preach on the pulpit. We, we just can't do that. We, we just cannot do that. If we're going to do deliverance effectively, we can't. Because then you're on the same side as the devil. Every morning, the priest is to add firewood firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings on it every morning. In other words, every day you will lay yourself again on the altar every day. Lord Jesus, anything else that is in me this today, burn it, consume it, take it. Lord, I'm going to sacrifice Everything that you need me to sacrifice, no matter how much I love those things, I'm going to lay it all on the altar for you. And verse 13, the fire must be kept burning on the altar 
continuously. It must not go out. So I just want to teach a little bit about the fire to say our God is a consuming fire. But also the fact that God is asking us to place ourselves on the altar. And we understand what the altar is. Pretty much it's a, it's a consecrated life. We must live a consecrated life to be effective in deliverance ministry. Okay, so turn your Bibles with me to Obadiah 117. I love this verse. Those who have listened to my second album, I, I began it by singing, Obadiah 117. I just did a little play, little vocal play with it. Um, and I just did that. Because that verse, I think it's from my album, My Deliverance Has Come, because I was talking about deliverance in that album. It says, but upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. Okay. I like to use this verse because a lot of people say that deliverance is not for the church. It's for unbelievers. It's unbelievers who have demons. Not This verse says that where? Upon Mount Zion. Who is Mount Zion? What is Mount Zion? Mount Zion is another name for the church. There shall be deliverance. So this is clearly not talking about salvation, right? Because if you're already part of the church, then you have already been saved. You have already come into Christ. So upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance and there shall be what? Holiness. Okay, why is the Bible talking about deliverance and holiness in the same sentence? So we begin to see the connection, right? There must be holiness upon Mount Zion. I know today holiness is not popular. And we see many so-called prophets who, are, who look like they are flowing in signs and wonders and miracles, right? They look like they're doing that, but still living, you know, an unholy life. I don't even want to go into the depth of how that is possible. But maybe at some point I will, I will touch on that. Because those people are not of God. There is a different way that they're getting. They, they have strange fire on the altar. As a fact, going back to Leviticus 6, right? There was not to be any strange fire on the altar. That's the reason why the altar was to be kept with the fire that had come from God burning continually. There was to be no room for any strange fire. So a lot of the prophets that we see who, who are dabbling in witchcraft or they, they, they're continually sleeping with the women in their churches and yet they still come and do what looks like miracles. That is strange fire on the altar. That's not fire from God. So I hope that you all understand that, you know, when, we, when we're talking about, when we begin to talk about the supernatural, when we begin to talk about fire, when we begin to talk about power, supernatural power, the devil can also mimic. We saw it, right, with Moses and Pharaoh's magicians. So the fact that the magician did what they did did not mean that it, their power was from God. So the fact that those prophets can still sleep with women and still come to, to a, a, a crusade or a conference and perform signs and wonders does not mean that their power is from God. So what I'm teaching here is if you, those of us who have not gone to a witch doctor, we have not gone to a deity to go take powers, those of us who are coming to get our power and authority from God, this is what we must do. And I remember the first time that Apostle Charles said to me, he said, you know, this whole thing is simple. He said, just read your Bible. <laughs> that's, what, that's how he put it, broke, broke it down for me. He was like, you want to walk in miracles? Just study your Bible. That was, it, it sounds like a really simple way of putting it. But like, in other words, he was saying to me, there's no place where we go to go get power. Where we go to go get supernatural power. We get it from the word of God. By understand, getting a revelation of these secrets that we're dissecting, right? When we study the word. So there must be holiness upon Mount Zion for there to be deliverance. Then the house of Jacob, who is the house of Jacob? Is the church. Only then can we possess our possessions, right? So the reason why, and ladies, I cry to God about this because 
it's not like I have arrived or anything. There's still so many things that I, I, I my, the, the level of anointing I carry is not even able to break it. And I cried to God and said, Father God, break me even more, cleanse me even more, reveal even more to me because I have not yet possessed my possessions. Have you possessed your possessions? Is there any one of us here who feels like everything God has for you, you're walking in it? No. So if we're not walking in, in, in it yet, if we have not yet possessed our possessions, maybe we've just had a, you know, we just have little bits of it. What is the missing link? And if you open your mouth and you're, you're pray, as prayerful as you already are, each of you here are already quite prayerful, right? But yet you're not able to command a demon to loose from someone and they obey you. What does that tell you? I know what it tells me that there's still more areas in my life because God is not the, the problem. There's still things in my life that don't reflect holiness. There's still things in my life that are preventing the fire from burning continuously. So in order for there to be deliverance upon Mount Zion and for the house of Jacob to possess her possessions, there must be holiness. Okay, now let's go to verse 18. So Obad, we just read verse 17. Let's go to verse 18 of Obadiah 1. It says, and the house of Jacob shall what? Shall be a fire, ladies. So not only must there be fire, on the altar where we lay ourselves as a sacrifice, but we then also become a fire. So if you don't become a fire, it says, and the house of Joseph, a what? A flame. And the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them, right? So these are, God is giving us the secrets to deliverance here in order to kindle them, devour them, for them to become a stubble. We must be a fire and a flame. And then there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. And we know what the house of Esau represents, right? The house of Esau represents, you know, the, the rebellious house, the house that is in darkness. For the Lord has spoken it. So I wanted to tell you ladies today that we must be a fire. You must be a constant fire. That you, we, we need to grow to a point where the more we spend time in prayer, in worship, in fasting, in the presence of God, just laying at his feet, in knowing God more, in getting revelation knowledge of the word, the more we do that, the more we start to get to a place where I have watched my spiritual father walk into a room and demons just begin to shout when he has not even said anything. As a matter of fact, I can show you guys some videos. I have videos of him entering a crusade ground with many, hundreds of people. He's just walking and, and demons are shouting. So I know that I have some growing to do. I know you have some growing to do. So he did not even have to open his mouth and begin to say, come out, come out, lose her, lose him. So the more the fire, the more you are kindled as a fire, the enemy knows, he sees it. See, we only see with our physical eyes, but the, remember the enemy is a spirit, right? He sees who has fire. He sees who is burning continually and he sees who is not burning continually. So all of us, me included, if we are still having demonic attacks continually, if we're still having uh, uh, spirit husbands visiting us at night in our dreams, if all these crazy things are still happening in our lives, that means that we don't yet carry enough fire. For a minute, let's forget about going to do deliverance on somebody else's problems. My own life, your own life. If there's still a mountain in front of you achieving the things that you, God wants to achieve for you to achieve in your life, if the enemy is not afraid of you, he can still come and stand in your way. That means you don't carry enough fire yet. That means I don't carry enough fire yet. Mm -hmm. 
So as a deliverance worker, we must become a flame of fire. God wants us to be on fire for him, to burn from, for him. Many people cannot bring deliverance to themselves and to others. Why? Because they're cold. So the whole point of us doing deliverance, you know, the deliverance teaching we're going to go through in T2 is to get us to a place where my prayer is that this training will ignite the fire in you to help make even your own life better. Because I was just you know, meditating on this the other day. And, and there's many people that when I've done one-on-one -on -one sessions with them, I've told them that, look, no matter how much fire the minister carries, if you don't carry fire, you know what's going to happen? If all you can do is go ask the prophet to pray for you, or to cast your demons out. What's going to happen is that you will not be able to maintain your deliverance. Because the enemy will still keep coming at you in certain ways. Because he's not afraid of you. As a matter of fact, let me even rephrase that. It's not like he's afraid of any of us, right? He's afraid of the fire in us. Who is the fire in us? Right? What did we just learn? We learn that our God is a consuming fire, right? Hebrews 12, 29. So the consuming fire that is in us burning, that's what the devil is afraid of. And when we get to that place where we're so hot, where we're burning continually, then it wards off the devil. It wards him off. What happens if a fire, if you, if you start to take a fire close to somebody's hands, what happens? They start to shift their hands. They start to pull their hands away because the heat is too much. I don't know if I, if I shared this experience with you guys before. Something happened to me one time, maybe about five, six years ago. I was traveling to Africa. As a matter of fact, that was years ago. My dad was still alive, but he was sick and I was going to see him. I remember when I changed planes in, you know, to go to Cameroon, you go through Europe. I changed planes. I believe I flew from here to Washington, DC. And then I was, we were to get into the aircraft in DC that was going to take us to, to, to Europe, to Belgium. As I walked, that was the first time I ever experienced anything like this. And I just remembered it now because it somewhat explains what I'm teaching. And I was going to Cameroon. And as I entered the aircraft, I approached my seat. As I got to closer to my seat, an, older, an old woman, as I came towards the seat, she immediately stood up and ran in the opposite direction. Ladies. I had never experienced anything like this. You know how the middle aisle of a, those big aircrafts that fly across the, the Atlantic, right? There was like, gosh, is it like five or six seats in that middle section? As I was coming on the right aisle, she immediately ran, jumped off the, she was supposed to be sitting next to me. She had already sat down. As I came and I got closer, she just jumped up and ran. On the, on the towards the left aisle and she stood there and she was looking at me from a distance. So there was another man that was supposed to be sitting after her. So I was sit, supposed to sit here. She was supposed to be next and there was a man after her. The, he was confused. He asked her, what's the matter? She said, my perfume is too strong. She cannot take it. She answered exactly that. It, it did not even fully click to me immediately what was, I mean, that was about, like I said, five to six years back. I was not where I am now spiritually, right? I didn't fully grasp what was going on. She stood there. She wouldn't come back. She said, no, she can't. She, she, there's no way she can sit next to me. The man, like, he looked at her in confusion. And finally, he's like, oh, well, okay, I'll, I'll sit next to, to her. So he came and he sat. Ladies, I did not even have perfume on me. I don't spray perfume to travel. I just use deodorant. So he came and he sat next to me. 
She, she never came back. She asked the hostess to switch her seats. They did. So I got to Cameroon. And when I saw my father and the Lord, I was telling him. That's when I understood what was going on. So sometimes when you, you will encounter certain people who may carry the opposite fire, strange fire, right? They know what you carry. Because spirit to spirit, right? The spirits know. So as much as we're still growing in what we carry, you'll be amazed to see that the enemy knows. He knows what is in us. If we can only believe in what is in us, because most of us do not even believe in what is in us. And that experience showed me that there was something that I carried that the enemy was afraid of. I knew that it was not my perfume. So let's talk about who can minister deliverance. Let me hear from you all. Who can minister deliverance? Ladies, on mute, please. Hello. I know Sister Afia says she's somewhere she can. The rest of you on mute, please, and just share. With, what is your understanding of who can minister deliverance? I think I, based on the teaching, mm -hmm. anyone who carries the fire and who themselves okay. are delivered, yeah, are going to be able to conduct deliverance and impart that same fire on others. Amen. 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 So I like what, you know, Minister Star said, anybody, right? Any, when we say anybody, not just anybody, but any, frankly speaking, any child of God should, you notice, right? Deliverance is not one of the fivefold offices. It's not a ministry office. It's not. It's something that every minister should be able to do. And not just any minister, but any child of God. The best example I can give is like how, you know, the word of God tells us that Paul says that, you know, we should all, you can all, everybody can desire to prophesy, right? Everybody can desire to prophesy. Everybody can actually prophesy, but not everyone is a prophet. So God can give us the way I usually describe it is, you know, you can have a deliverance mantle, right? People who have deliverance mantles, usually they have that a, a, a different level of boldness, a, of fearlessness towards the kingdom of darkness, right? But everybody is not going to necessarily be able to do deliverance at the same level. But every child of God should be able to do deliverance to some level. You get what I'm saying? Because if, if you, for example, if you sit in a, in a, in a fivefold office, that in itself comes with a, with, with a different level of authority, even if we're not talking about deliverance, right? The fivefold offices come with a gov governmental authority in the kingdom. So the fact that you have governmental authority in itself, it tells you that if someone in the fivefold office who is consecrated is doing deliverance, they will carry a different level of authority to a regular believer who is not in a fivefold office. But everyone who is a child of God should be able to do deliverance. You just need to do the things that I've been explaining, like, like uh, Minister Starr said. You need to live a consecrated life. You need to live a clean life. You need to, be, to carry that fire. You need to be constantly burning on the altar. So according to Jesus' words, every believer can minister deliverance. Amen? Amen. Amen. So first of all, we see that Jesus calls his followers to start by preaching the gospel in order that the first phase of deliverance can take place, right? He sends them to go into all the world. He tells them to first of all, go and do that. So we must first teach people about Jesus and lead them to receive salvation. We must never... Deliverance is not a ministry that should be a standalone. 
I remember when I first started, you know, when I was doing deliverance in the hotel, my spiritual father would say to me, don't just do deliverance. It should be part of a, a, a package deal, right? If, if, you, if all you do is deliverance, then you, th there's no difference between you and a, and a witch doctor, for example. You and a, is it Babalao? As they, they call them in Nigeria, right? Because we are not... People are not supposed to just come to us and say, oh, you know what? The, the devil is tormenting me. Pray for me. And then you pray for them and they go, no. Deli the whole point of deliverance, the reason why Jesus gives us the power, the authority to do deliverance, it's all part of the salvation package. It's about reconciling the children of God back to Abba Father. So if somebody is, is having extramarital relations, for example, and because of that, they keep having dreams of, of, of demons at night. And they don't want to stop that. And they want to just come to you to pray to remove the demons. It's not going to work that way. Deliverance should be, should be offered as part of the whole package. Where someone is saved, we bring them to Christ. And then when they come to Christ, we understand that we must minister deliverance to them because if we don't minister deliverance to them, they're going to remain in certain, certain parts of their lives will remain in bondage. And that's where the freedom now comes in. They will never be free enough to walk in the full potential of who they are in Christ. That's what deliverance is for. We cannot do it in isolation. So we start by preaching the gospel to people, ensuring that they have accepted Christ. Because outside of Christ, there is no deliverance. If, a non, if an unbeliever comes to you and says that demons keep chasing me at night, pray for me. The, you want to begin by saying, you know what? If you want me to pray for you, I can only help you through Christ. So let's first talk about you accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, because when you accept him as your Lord and Savior, then he can, he, he can deliver you from darkness. When he does that, now the deliverance starts to become effective in your life because first you are saved. Now I'm saying this and some of you may be wondering, does that mean that a person who is not saved cannot be delivered? They can but that should not be the norm. What am I saying? God would allow unbelievers to receive deliverance so that they can know Jesus, right? Deliverance should all be about bringing people to Jesus. So you're gonna find that sometimes in a gathering, in a conference, in a Christian conference or a crusade or whatever, where there are many unbelievers there, right? People may begin to experience deliverance when the presence of God is thick in the atmosphere, even though they have not given their lives to Christ. Why? Because that is their encounter with Jesus. Jesus is wanting to reveal himself to them as the powerful master, as the king, as Lord, as the one who is more powerful than whatever they have known in their prior life. Sometimes a, 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 a witch doctor may be in a crusade ground and suddenly gets delivered. Why? Because Jesus wants to reveal himself to that witch doctor to show him that he, Jesus, is more powerful than the devil that the witch doctor was serving. So sometimes deliverance will happen like that without even the pastor or the prophet or the apostle specifically going to that witch doctor and saying, oh, you need to surrender your life to Jesus before I can pray for you or, or even lead them to Christ first. You know, sometimes, you know, God is sovereign. He will skip the steps and give that person an encounter of who he is and his power and authority. So you will find that sometimes deliverance will happen in that way. And I myself, I have experienced many instances where I was praying or I was just worshiping and people began to manifest. Not because I went to them and said, oh, now I want to do deliverance on you. Let's start by doing this first and then this next. And no, no, no. There's times when God in his sovereignty 
will just encounter, give somebody an encounter and just pull them in. Because when people experience that, the salvation process now is even easier because they know that God has touched them. So I wanted to put this in context because deliverance is not about showmanship. It's not about us showing some other minister that we have more power than them. No, it's not about dramatization. Let, let the whole world see that I can do deliverance. That's not what it's about. So if you want to walk in this grace, you have to understand this aspect that I just explained. Because it's all about, it's just like how the word of God says that, you know, the, the, the prophecy is, is the spirit of Jesus, right? The spirit of prophecy is, is about Jesus. It's the same with deliverance. It's all about Jesus. If God can trust you that you're not going to use his power that he gives you for deliverance just to show people what you can do. If he can trust you that you, you can, you're going to use deliverance to bring his children home then he's going to begin to give you more power to, ex to more authority to, to exercise over the devil. Amen. Amen. So all about Jesus. It's not about just, let me just go gather some people in the room and I just begin to say fire, 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 go, go in the name of Jesus. Blood of no, no, no. If, if I'm beginning to do, what's the point of that? And if I know that somebody is living a sinful life, and they keep coming to me for prayer, I need to be able to sit them down and explain to them. Deliverance is not something you come and eat of. Deliverance is what? The children's bread. That's what the Bible says. So it's not something you come and eat of and go back into sin, right? Go and sin no more. I have to be able to sit down that person, have a conversation with them about their life, about them giving their life to Jesus and beginning to walk in holiness. Make sure that me, I come into that understanding with that person, then I can minister deliverance to them. And that's why sometimes you, some of you, maybe someone like Vario has been with me for a while, may have heard me say this. Sometimes it, people may be calling me, pursuing me for prayer. Sometimes I'm not, I'm not really following back up with them for prayer. There's some things that we do as ministers sometimes that people may just think, oh, it's just because she's busy or, or, or why, is she avoid, you know, why is she refusing to pray for me? I've, oh, she's proud. She's not. No, no, no. There's times when you know that this person does not want to have a serious conversation about walking in righteousness, but they just want to come take prayer just because the enemy is biting their flesh and they want some relief from that pain. Just because you're sick and lying in a hospital bed and you want free, you want healing, but you don't want the Jesus of the healing. You get what I'm saying? So as ministers, when we want to minister deliverance, we have to be very careful that we are not selling deliverance, if I can use that word, in isolation. It has got to be part of the whole package of salvation and walking in Christ, walking in righteousness. Because if, if you're doing deliverance and it's not bringing people to Jesus, it's not showing people Jesus' mercy. De deliverance speaks to the mercy of God. Deliverance speaks to the love of God towards his children. Deliverance speaks to the heart of Abba Father, who does not want to see us suffer in the hands of an enemy. So the person who you're ministering deliverance to must understand all these things. If you're doing deliverance and it's not showing them the heart of Abba Father, then something is missing somewhere. Then it's for your own glory. And that's not what deliverance is about. And God will not even trust you with his authority and his power. And that's why you guys notice, you guys know I talk a lot about repentance coming out of a sinful lifestyle. Why? Because with how much I talk about deliverance, I, I must have that balance. You don't come and eat from God's table and just go back into, into, into the, the world. No. So the louder I shout about deliverance, the more I have to be shouting about, this is all about repentance. This is all about salvation. This is all about knowing Jesus and his love for you and his heart for you. Knowing that he's merciful. He wants to bring you to a better place. He wants you to walk in freedom. 
So Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? So I was saying how it's all about, we must all go and preach the gospel first. It's about the gospel. Deliverance is not an isolated ministry. It's a, it's a part, it's a, it's something that God gives us to enhance our ability to preach the gospel and win the souls and bring them home. Because there's some people that are so bound that unless you can minister deliverance to them, they will never come home. And there's some people that their bondage, they, some people who have been denying the power of Christ. But when they, when they, they, when they go through deliverance, they know that is the story of our sister Ngum and how she came to the Lord. The Lord showed her his power in such a powerful way. She could not deny that that was God. So that's how, that's how we do deliverance. It starts with going into all the world and preach the gospel. Now you're going to meet some people who they, they will not listen to the gospel. They would mock the gospel. They will laugh at it. They may already be serving the devil. And for those kinds of people, deliverance may be the only thing. Because when, you, when the power of God falls down and they find themselves rolling on the floor, crying and vomiting and manifesting, they know that a higher power has encountered the lesser power that they were serving before. So I don't believe that you can grow in ministry and just ignore deliverance like some ministers are doing out there because it, it inhibits, it hampers, it limits your ability to win any soul that God sends your way. Because some souls, that's the only way they're going to come in. Okay? So your salvation does not just end with you being translated from darkness into his marvelous light. Once we have settled the issue of, of coming into the light with these people, right? Now we want to start dealing with all those things, all the baggage, all the bondage that is in their lives. And you cannot be effective in doing that. That's why the church is packed with people who are bound. Because many pastors bring them and it stops at salvation. Nothing more happens. People are being tormented in, in a lot of our churches. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. In other words, shall be delivered. But he that believeth shall not be damned. So Jesus did not leave us in darkness about the sequence of the developments after salvation, right? After you have accepted Christ, we need to move on to that next phase. Because if you don't, once you get saved, the kingdom of darkness begins to, they immediately assign spiritual agents to begin to work against you. And that's why there's many people who are going to notice that once they got saved, their life got worse. There was a time when I felt like, oh my goodness, I thought, okay, when you get saved, things should get better. But no, for many people, after they get saved, things get worse. Things get worse and they'll be like, oh, I thought you, you told me that when I come to Jesus, he will do this for me and that for me. You know why? Because now the enemy has marked you. He has assigned demons to block everything you touch. Why? so that you should go back into darkness, so that you should backslide, you should reject Jesus, so that you will not even believe that Jesus loves you. You will not believe that you've been saved because you're going to be like, you know what? From the day I made this confession, I've had nothing but trouble in my life. <laughs> and the same thing happens when you accept the call into ministry. It happens at a higher level. So now you're saved. The enemy is coming at you in many different ways to make you think that you're not really saved. And by the way, even though you're saved, now you don't have money. You've lost all your finances. Your spouse left you. Your children start taking drugs. All these crazy things that happen. You're like, okay, where's the God I thought I was coming to serve? Okay, years have passed, right? You've settled that aspect. Now God begins to call you into ministry. You're playing around. You're not really accepting the call, right? 
one foot in, one foot out. You're dancing around. You're doing the Jonah. Finally, you're like, okay, God, I surrender to you. I'm going to serve you. Anything you want me to do. When you do that, ladies, all hell breaks loose on you. And sometimes for years, I went through that. You guys have heard me say that all the time. I went through that so many times that I, I kept saying I didn't want to do ministry. Everything I touched was attacked. It's like nothing was working out in my life. Why is that? <clears throat> because he now assigns higher ranking demons. So that's why some of you, you're sitting for years. You're praying about something to break in your life. It's not breaking. You're praying for some doors to open in your life. It's not opening. Why? Because the enemy knows that, you know, you've accepted to serve the Lord. He wants to discourage you. He wants to make you feel that you don't have any power. He makes, wants to make you feel that Jesus lied. God is lying to you. God's word is not true in your life. So that you're going to give up the whole ministry thing and say, I'm not even going to be bothered with ministry. My ministry is not working. I'm praying nobody's getting healed. I'm praying for doors to open. Nobody's listening to me. I'm singing. Nobody thinks my music, my, my worship is doing anything to them. Nobody's inviting me to come preach anywhere. Okay, God, I'm not even going to bother with all of this. That's the reason why. So I'm saying all of this to say there's always a battle. There's never going to be a time in our existence as believers when the enemy is going to leave us alone. Matthew 4. <coughs> he will leave you and I for a season and then he will come back at another season. He will keep doing that. At every level that you grow in ministry or as a believer, he will send higher ranking demons to challenge you. So until you get to a place where you stop running away, you stop fearing him. You stop fearing deliverance. And you say, ladies, I'll never forget the day I had suffered so much. And my spiritual father was in Dallas one year. And I, 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 I remember, I think I was driving him back to the airport. He had finished his ministry time in Dallas. And I turned and I looked at him and I said, I said, daddy, I will make sure that the devil pays for every turmoil, every confusion, everything he has stolen from my life. That's why I do deliverance fearlessly. Because when I th think about the sufferings that I personally had gone through in my own life, the things he put my family members through, I got to a point where I decided, I made a decision. When I understood that God's power and authority was available to me. I did, not, I did not need to curl up like a fetus, a fearful fetus anymore on the ground, crying and weeping every day and running from the devil. I understood that I will no longer run from the enemy. I will pursue my pursuers and I will overtake them in the name of Jesus. We all have to come to that place where we decide that I'm not going to let the devil just keep beating up on me because guess what? He will never give up. The only way you overcome him is by understanding. Think about it. From before Jesus was born, the enemy had plans to kill the baby, right? While Jesus walked the earth as he was growing up, the enemy had plans to take him out all the way to the cross. Towards the end of Jesus' life, the devil actually thought he had finally succeeded when Jesus lay on the cross. So what is that saying to you and I? Until the day we are lying in that casket, six feet under, the enemy is going to keep trying to take us out. And we only overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. By the word of our testimony. That is why I'm coming back to testify to you guys about my own journey, my own story, using my own life, my own testimony 
to raise more soldiers in the kingdom of God. Because if you choose to say, oh, I'm just going to be tiptoeing around the devil. Oh my goodness. He's going to roast you and take you to the cleaners. He will do that with you. He will do it with your spouse. He will do it with your children, with your grandchildren, with your sister, your brother, your mother, your father. He will do it. The Bible says that he comes to steal. That's the God already gave us his job description. He came to steal from you, to kill you, to destroy you. He will do it till the day that God calls you home. So I hope this is helping you guys to come to that same place of determination that I came to. Because we need to understand that Jesus has already made provision for our protection. There's nothing for us to be afraid of. But until we know the authority we carry in Christ, the enemy is going to keep beating up on us. And no matter how much I pray for you, if you don't understand the things I'm teaching today, it will not last. You will not be able to keep it. Because when you go back home, I'm not there with you. When you sleep at night, I'm not there in your dreams. And that's why sometimes, sometimes you may call me for prayer for certain things. I may not really do it that time also because as part of your own growth and development, you need to learn to fight certain spiritual battles yourself. Because if I pray for you every time you have certain kind of problems, you don't grow and come into that same place. Mark 16, 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. I love this verse when I'm teaching deliverance because the verse does not say, and this sign shall follow deliverance ministers. It doesn't say these signs shall follow prophets or apostles. No or evangelists mm -mm. have you believed all of you here today have you believed if you have believed then these signs need to follow you what are the signs in my name shall they cast out devils isn't it interesting that the first sign that that jesus says is not even tongues but those of us in the Pentecostal and Evangelical churches, we are the tongue-talking parts of the body of Christ, right? We love tongues. If I tell everybody on mute now, let's go into prayer. We're going to la da da ba 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 da da ba We're going to start going at it. Isn't it a wonder that the church has not embraced the casting out of devils to the same extent that we have embraced speaking in tongues? Have you ever wondered that? The first thing that Jesus said was they shall cast out devils before he said they will speak in new tongues. So if you believe in Jesus, the requirement for being able to cast out devils is believing. Meaning after you're saved and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then you can begin to administer deliverance to yourself and to others. Mark 16, 18 says, they shall take up serpents. So when you have believed, you can cast out devils. You can speak in tongues. You can take up serpents. What are serpents? Serpentine spirits. Serpents represent Satan in his cohorts. And if they drink any deadly thing, evil deposits, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, healing ministry, and they shall recover. Now you're going to find many more people who feel more comfortable with healing ministry than deliverance ministry. But you know why? Because the devil knows that that's where we really get him. So he has made sure that most of us start off our lives as believers, not wanting to have anything to do with deliverance. Luke 10, 17. And the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Ladies, believe this. I want each of you to believe that devils can be subject to you because you carry Jesus. 
because you carry that consuming fire. Remember, your God is a consuming fire, right? Devils are subject unto us through that. That's how I used to come back to Apostle Charles. When I first started doing deliverance, I used to come back to him in shock. When I would do, I would raise my hands, the demons would begin to shout. I'll be like, oh my goodness. It, it took me by surprise when it first started happening. That's what the disciples did. They came to Jesus and they're like, oh my goodness. Even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. You see, many people still say in the churches, in the name of Jesus and nothing happens. Ladies, I cannot say this enough. You will experience the power of God when you get a, a deep revelation of the word of God. You can say Jesus a hundred times and nothing changes in your situation. But when you catch the revelation of the true power that is behind the name of Jesus, then now you can apply that name on a devil and he manifests and runs out. So it's not just in calling the name. What is the revelation you have behind that name? Luke 10, 18. And he said unto them, I beheld, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He's fallen from heaven. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you what? Power. So to the point that Sister Gail brought up in the beginning, right? Our father who was in heaven, right? Skip, skip, skip. Deliver us from evil. So yes, when I'm praying by myself, there are times when I say, Father God, please deliver me from this problem. Please set me free from this problem. Oh God, please break these chains over my life. When I'm talking to my Abba Father, I, I do that. Because that was how to pray when I'm praying to God. But guess what? Praying to God is different to casting out devils. And I think I began to teach Minister Valerie and Minister Afia this when I brought them into a deliverance session to watch me. And I, I said this to them. When you're standing in front of a demon situation, at that point, you are not praying. You should have already prayed. You already pray in, your, in the secret place, right? When you're one-on-one -on -one with your father God, you pray to him right? But when you're now standing in front of the devil, you cast him out. Because your prayer life, remember, you've been burning on the altar already. You carry fire already. Now you just unleash that fire on the devil. So you just take authority. You don't pray at that point. Amen? Behold, I give you power to tread now you are treading. You are trampling and treading on the devil. You are not praying on serpents and scorpions and over all, ladies, listen to this again. And over what? All, all the power of the, all, not some of the power of the enemy. I pray that this is stirring up your faith. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. So when the devil is coming, when we go through that phase in our ministerial growth, when the enemy begins to threaten us, right? He begins to reveal himself to you in frightening ways because he wants you to run away from, from ministry. When, he, when you enter that season, remember Luke 10, 19. That no, all the enemy can do is trigger fear in you he, he cannot hurt you god will not allow him to hurt you if you believe you have power over all of all of the the power of the enemy so the power you carry is greater over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you you're covered by the blood in other words this is Jesus talking. Amen. Numbers 23, 23. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob. Surely there is no enchantment against Linda. Neither is there any divination against Oscarine. 
according to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what has God wrought? So the Bible has, there's so many verses we could pull if we had all day to be here. Okay, so let's quickly talk about, because we're going to be coming to a close soon for tonight. Let's quickly talk about um, different ways that deliverance can happen. The first one, I, I believe I described it earlier, which is what I, we, we typically call the power encounter. The power encounter is where somebody just encounters the power of God. Remember the example I gave before, right? Maybe an unbeliever, even a witch doctor, a magician comes into a crusade ground, comes into a gateway conference, for example. You know, they come there and no minister was coming, laid hands on them, did not even come close to them. I'm sure we've all gone to Christian conferences where suddenly we just hear somebody just screaming in the back or somewhere in the middle, right? They just start to scream and manifest. That is a power encounter. God just unleashed his power, the atmosphere, and person encountered and deliverance has to be played. right the next type of deliverance i want to talk about is inner healing those of you who came to the our our um oasis jars christian women's retreat with uh, myself and prophet roslyn we do inner healing and even uh, some of the work that i do with you guys one-on-one -on -one, the counseling sessions right that's inner healing where we spend time and work with you. It's a process. We take you to a process. Inner healing, most of the time, is a process. I mean, can it happen instantly? Yeah, you know, God can do anything. But most of the time, inner healing is not like the power encounter. It's a process where God begins to peel out those layers in your life of lies that the enemy has put in you, hurts that he has instilled from your childhood, Mother wounds, father wounds, betrayals, rape, all those things that have happened in your life, they have piled up on top of each other. They've caused you to lose confidence in yourself. It's causing you not to even believe the word of God. So everything I'm teaching here today, you cannot even believe it because you have so much hurt and pain in your life that you first need, you need inner healing. That's a form of deliverance. And for inner healing, we're not necessarily telling the devil, we're not necessarily shouting, uh, casting out. We're not necessarily doing that. So that's another form of deliverance. Then there is a one-on-one -on -one deliverance. And Minister Zafia and, and um, Valerie have, they've accompanied me where I've worked with some of the T2 women for one-on-one -on -one deliverance. Right? That's where we with one person who has a, a situation where the enemy is doing something to them and we're taking authority and commanding the devil to lose them, right? And then there's mass deliverance. And all of you, I believe, have also seen me do mass deliverance. I did it when we, when we had the three-day fasting. Mass deliverance is where you're not necessarily targeting one person, right? You're just releasing the fire out there. You're releasing the blood. You're just calling on the name of Jesus. And it is changing the atmosphere in the whole room or in the whole wherever we are. And when the atmosphere becomes saturated with the power of God, individual people just begin to experience deliverance. That's mass deliverance. And we may, that's mainly used in Christian conferences and crusades, in situations where there's many people, you don't have enough time to take each one person and be talking about the whole history and go break down inner healing first. And at what time did your father touch you in the wrong place and begin to deal with that? We, you know, in situations where we cannot do that, we just bring down the power of God into the atmosphere and the Holy Spirit just does his, his thing. So that's mass deliverance. It's kind of like dropping a bomb over a city and it just, it begins to destroy. Now, it takes more experience to be able to do that usually as we grow. When I first started doing deliverance, I couldn't do that. But as we grow, you know, God trusts you with more and more power, more, more authority. You get to a point where you can just do that. Amen. 
So let me see. We have about 15 more minutes before we shut down for today. I'm trying to figure out. Okay, let me quickly go through how the enemy enters into people. I, I, I usually call it, well, entry points, right? The entry points into our lives. The Bible says that we, our bodies are the temple of the living God, right? But the enemy loves to come and mess it up. He, he, he's a defiler. And it's up to us. And that's the reason why it's very important that we don't live a life of sin. Because when we live a life of sin, we are opening the doors. I always talk about open doors, right? Every time that the enemy is tormenting us, we have to ask ourselves, what is the door that is open? Through what door did he come in, right? A stranger cannot come into my house. Like right now, my front door is locked. If a, a stranger suddenly finds himself in my house, there, there must have been some door in the house that was open. He either came through the front door or the back door or a window. Or maybe he lifted the, the, the roof and jumped in from the top. Maybe he dug a hole underneath the ground and came in from the bottom. So there must be a door. So we ask, if we, for us to do deliverance, we have to understand the doors in our own lives and in the lives of the people that we minister deliverance to. Because until we close those doors, there's no point to do deliverance. And that's why I was saying earlier that some people may ask me for prayer sometimes. I may not want to do it. Because if I know that they have not closed certain doors in their lives, there's no point because then the demons will still keep coming in. If you're telling somebody who's living with their girlfriend that you need to stop doing this before I pray for you and they're telling you, no, I, I, I don't want to leave my girlfriend. There's no need for you to pray deliverance or maybe in the night, in the night they have spirit spouses come defile them. And yet they're telling you, pray for me, but then they're living with their girlfriend. It's not going to work. So let's quickly talk about open doors, right? Or how entry points, how the enemy enters. Let's talk first of all, the eyes, what you watch, what you see. Don't watch stuff that would defile you. Get off of horror movies, pornographic stuff. Leave those things alone. The more you grow in the Lord, the closer you get to Jesus. Every time you encounter something that is defiled, it's like my system, I, I, I cannot even take it. There's some things if I look at it, it messes me. It's like, I, I just feel so uneasy. My, 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 my spirit just rejects it so much. If I enter into certain environments, even if I just look at certain people, people who are, are carrying a lot of baggage and it's, you know, like spiritually evil stuff, I, I pick it up so heavy in my spirit. I'm like, ooh, you know. So as you grow, you, you, can, you, set, you can discern it. They can put on a movie. You don't have to have seen a summary of what the movie was about. The moment certain things appear there, it just makes your butt, you just know that, uh-uh, I cannot take this. This is not for me. Because the more God cleans you up, once you encounter darkness, it's like you want to throw up spiritually, if I can describe it like that. It starts to, that's why I say I refuse to go to the movie theater. Because I can't look at those things. So the eyes, Matthew 6, 22, take this down. It says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. So if your eye is only seeing the word of God, good things, pure things, clean things, then your whole body will be full of light. This is actually another Bible verse that even supports the fact that we must be in the word a lot because if the word is what we see most of the time, it's bringing light into the dark parts of our life in itself. It does deliverance. Verse 23 says, but if then I be evil, if you keep looking at evil things, if you keep exposing your eye to evil things, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. So the eye is a portal. It's a spiritual portal. I think I have a teaching called spiritual portals in which I simply just deal with, with stuff like this. But if your, your eye is a portal, what you let go through your eye 
I call them eye gates because it's a gate. That's what is going to be filled in your body. It says your whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So it's very important that we, we begin to be, be more watchful. There may be things that maybe sometimes you join your family and do. If you want to grow in your anointing, you're going to start. Consecration means what? You're set apart. Things that others can do, you cannot do. Things that others can see and look at, you cannot look at. You cannot watch or, or listen to things where people keep cursing, using swear words and curse words. If you keep listening to that, it's polluting you. Ephesians 4, 27 to 30. As a matter of fact, 27, neither give place to the devil. So don't give place to the, how do you give place to the devil? Your gates. Okay. So many of us are called. We are anointed. There's a powerful calling in us, but it may not be manifesting because we are clogged up. We're clogged up with all the evil things that we've been consuming through our eyes, through our ears. The ears is another one. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, said, are you listening to things that the enemy is saying continually? Are you listening to demonic things, satanic things? Has God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So what are you listening to? Who are you listening to? If you're listening to people who are corrupting you, then it's messing up your stream, your your. your let me see your prophetic stream or your apostolic stream or your pastoral stream, whatever your anointing is, is messing up that stream. You can just have certain kinds of conversations with people and the enemy can, pose, can demonize, you can get demonized just by engaging in certain conversations. The wrong spirit can transfer from somebody into you because you, you chose to engage or you chose to remain in an atmosphere where people were watching some evil stuff or listening to some evil stuff. Your mind is another one. What you allow to enter your mind, what you allow yourself to think. The enemy can drop certain thoughts in your mind, but you can reject it, right? If the enemy drops a thought like he did with King David and he keeps watching the woman, the naked woman, then that becomes a stronghold. So when the enemy introduces certain thoughts, maybe somebody who hurts you, the enemy starts to come and introduce thoughts of how you're going to pay them back. Reject it. If you don't reject, you begin to entertain it and say, oh, this person did this to me. I'm going to teach them a lesson. You begin to entertain it. Guess what? It becomes demonic. You can become demonized just by entertaining thoughts that the enemy drops in your mind. The things that you eat, what you put in your mouth, those, these are all gates. These are all open doors. Amen. What you speak with your mouth. So not just what enters, but what comes out. As a matter of fact, what comes out is even more important than what goes in to your mouth. But what goes in, obviously, you know that you can ingest poison, right? Yeah. You can even ingest spiritually contaminated food. For those of us who come from Africa, we understand that. They can put something in your food and you eat it and you go mad the next day. <laughs> you know? So Matthew 15, 11, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. So if you keep using cuss words, you keep saying evil stuff, it invites evil spirits into your life. Okay. So I think well, our time is almost up. I'm going to stop here for today. Um, 
yeah, I'm going to stop here for today. We just have four minutes to go. And um, we've done about, yeah, we're in a good place. I'll stop here for today. So we've covered some of the entry points, right? Into how people become demonized. It's important that you understand that because when you understand that you can pray specifically into that area. If you meet somebody who curses a lot, there's a way that you may pray for them differently. You can pray about their mouth. You can pray about their mind because what they're cussing is coming from their mind. You know, it begins to, to, to channel your prayers in a certain direction. So let me stop there for today. Um, we, I can take a few questions before we close in prayer. Okay, we want to unmute, ladies. Are we still here or have we gone to sleep? <laughs> ladies, yeah, yeah. please. Yeah. You know something, I have, there's something that I do that's not, I usually, I'm not able to watch um, messages when I'm ministering. Every time I finish ministering, I'm like people were either asking me a question or making a comment. I didn't even see it. So it's now that I'm just seeing um, some of what you all were saying. But anyway, let me just open it up so I can take a few questions. If anybody has any things they want to ask about the things I've shared today before we close in prayer. I have a question. Okay. If you stop demons, mm -hmm. where do they go? <laughs> I, mean, I know that in the Bible, it talks about... Uh, the demons asking Jesus, would you put this, put us in these pigs, you mm -hmm. know, instead of, I forget what the rest of it is, but they asked, can you send us here? Mm -hmm. Instead of, I don't, well, I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> I was actually going to handle that at a different session so we can just talk about it in a bit more detail, but, um, yeah, that's what we, I mean, we can see from Jesus's example, right. That they begged him to send them into the pigs and he did that. So that tells us that to answer your question, where do demons go when they cast out, they can go into animals when they cast out, they can go into another human being when they cast out, they can also just go into open spaces. The Bible also tells us that, right. In the book of Matthew, when the devil is cast out, he goes into desert dry places and he doesn't find any rest. Then he comes back to look for his. So these are different options of where he can go. There's a number of places where he can go. Because the time has not come yet where they're totally going to be cast, you know, where they're going to be, you know, put away. So all they do is demons don't die, right? I, I know as much as, especially those who, are familiar with spiritual warfare in the African community. You're going to hear a lot of African people praying and saying, die by fire. That, they, don't, they don't die. Demons don't die. <laughs> so um, I don't even pray like that. I don't use die by fire. Not really because, you know, they don't die. They just go prepared to either re-enter you or enter somebody else or enter maybe even an animal. There's some people who have pets in their homes and those there's demons in those pets. Mm -hmm. Until their day comes when the Lord deals with them and their master. And that's why all we do is we resist them, right? We make sure they're not, you know, they don't have authority over us. Because for now, we're supposed to share this space with them. <laughs> until Christ returns, right? We know that. So, so my, <coughs> sorry, my understanding is that they can't enter you unless you have a, a covenant with them? Um, yes and no. Obviously, if you have a covenant with them, definitely they can enter you. But, okay. And, and I'm glad you brought this question because this is one of the things that makes a lot of people fearful. I've had some people that have said to me, oh gosh, I don't want to be around you because when, when, if you're, doing, when you're doing deliverance, because what if the demon enters me? <clears throat> and my answer to them have always been, if demons could just enter you, then they will be entering all of us every day when we walk in the streets, when we go to work, 
there's all kinds of unbelievers in our workplaces, people who do satanic practices, all kinds of different religions of people. Guess what? <laughs> Demons would just be freely entering all of us if it worked that way. It doesn't. Demons cannot just jump out of one person into the next person. If you notice, they asked Jesus to send them to the peaks, right? They didn't even just jump into the peaks themselves. So the first thing I will say to you is that one of the safest places to be, especially if you're a child of God, is when deliverance is taking place with a minister who has authority. Because in that space, there's a servant of God who has authority over them. The fact that they are manifesting and coming out tells you that the minister of God has authority over them. So they cannot just do whatever they please. Right? It tells you that when I say the minister of God has authority over them, it means that Holy Spirit is there. The manifest presence of God is there. So in that moment, they don't just do whatever. They can just jump from one person and come into you, no. Now, they can if your doors are open. That's why I teach about open doors or entry points because that's why if you keep you don't even have to be a deliverance minister or anything like if you keep open doors demons walk in and out of your life even when you're just walking in the streets or you're just wherever you are if you continually living in sin watching the wrong things hearing the wrong things saying the wrong things thinking the wrong thoughts you know if you're entertaining the devil in all those ways then your life has open doors. So if you, if you encounter people who carry, who are demonic people, let me call them that for want of a better word. In other words, if you encounter people who are demonized or you encounter witch doctors or you know, demonic practitioners, soothsayers, palm readers, you encounter all those people, yes, it can move from them into you because your doors are open. Now, I'm not saying this for all of you to, to go out there and still and be afraid because, oh, I sinned the other day. And so that means that, I, oh, I watched a bad movie that, no. Okay. When it comes to sin, right? We, as a child of God, as long as you're not willfully living in sin, you are covered. When you begin to allow those open doors, then the, the Bible also talks about if the, the hedge is broken, the serpent will bite. So don't break the hedge, right? What did, what, did, um, what did Satan say to God about Job? He said, but have you not put a hedge around him? So all of us who are children of God, there is a hedge of protection around us. The enemy does not just come jump into us. He can't. A lot of what we are carrying is stuff that we've carried from even before we got saved, which is why I, I teach that when you get saved, you still need to go through deliverance because a lot of what the problems in our lives as believers are not necessarily new things. That, it's not necessarily because you went somewhere and a demon jumped into you just like that. A lot of what be, many believers battle with are generational bondages. Things that we were in our bloodlines before we got saved. Because when we get saved, we now close the doors, right? We've closed, shut the entry points. The gates are closed. But there was already things in us. It's kind of like there's already thieves inside this house and I close the front door. I need to still deal with the thieves inside the house, right? New bandits may not be able to come into the house but I already have some that were already inside the house from before. I need to deal with them. That's the whole point of deliverance for believers. Mm -hmm. So we have a hedge. God has put a hedge of protection around us. The blood of Jesus is our protection. Our salvation in itself is our protection, but we can break that hedge. How do we break the hedge? Those are some of the examples I just gave. If you're willfully living in sin, I don't mean you sin, Sinning is not the same as living in sin. I hope people get that. Mm -hmm. 
when you mix a sin, a lifestyle, it invites demons into your life. And that's why it's very important. That's why a lot of those prophets you guys hear me preach about all the time, many of them are demonized because they're living in sin. But then the gifts of God are without repentance. So if you were gifted, as if you were a gifted prophet, you may still be, be able to exhibit your gift, even though you are now demonized. So to answer, I see Minister Afia has a question. Can you please explain the transference of sin? For example, if an adulterous pastor lays hands on you, can they transfer the spirit of sexual immorality into you? It is possible because the, the Bible tells us that um, we should not be so quick to lay hands, right? The Bible wants about that. So the laying on of hands is not something that should be happening just anyhow. And the laying on of hands, think about it. If a minister can lay hands and you get well, right? That spirit of infirmity leaves your life. It means that a minister can also lay, or a person can also lay hands and the spirit of infirmity enters you. Mm -hmm. So yes, we should not just go anywhere and subject ourselves to people laying hands on us. I don't mean people just greeting you and shaking hands, no. I mean laying hands. So if you're not sure of a pastor or a minister, and I think Oscarine said that in the beginning, she went somewhere and she had a, a, a bad encounter. Don't allow yourselves. But let me say this also. If you carry fire, right? The demon should be running. You should not be afraid of, of, of other ministers who are sexually immoral, right? Because they should actually be trying to lay hands on you and they fall on the ground. It should get to a point where because of what you carry, I've actually seen situations where a minister is prophesying on people and laying hands. And when they, when they come by somebody who is anointed, they skip you. <laughs> Oh, the spirits know. So we should all get to a point where when somebody, a sexually immoral preacher, is praying for people on a, on a line, on, on a conference crusade uh, prayer line, the moment they take one look at you, they're like, uh, and this one, I'm not going to put hands on them. They skip you. It needs to come to that. We should grow in the fire that we carry to the point where it should not matter. where they cannot transfer anything into us. Because the devil cannot leave it. If you carry enough fire, even if the man puts his hand on you, that demon does not even want to beat by you. You get what I'm saying? In my little level where I am now, there's some demons that they know. They don't want, why, would, why do they want to be in me? They know what I'll, what I'll do to them. So it should get to a point where for each of us, as we grow at different levels, certain demons, will, even if a, a pastor who does not understand is trying to come put something on you, the demon himself is running in the opposite direction. It's like, no, this woman, mm -mm, I don't want anything to do with her. Yes, yeah, Sister Fiasse, I used to not understand why at conferences and crusades, no one would lay hands on me. Yes. So sometimes that's why that's happening. They see that you carry the spirit of God. If you're in a crusade where it's a false prophet, they're going to skip you. They will not pray for you. They will not prophesy to you either. They will not lay hands on you. If they know that what you carry is stronger than theirs, they won't. That is to be so much. Yeah. And that demon himself does not want to with you. There's this write-up that I see sometimes on social media, right? That says that the, the devil say, oh my God, this woman is this, this woman has woken up this morning. Because the woman wakes up more on the kingdom of darkness till she goes to bed at night. So he never want to do it. So he will not even try to jump into you. He can't. When I go out there, I'm confident that no demon is going to look at me and try to just come and jump into me. Because he knows what will happen to him if he tries to jump into me. So as we grow in our confidence, in, our, in the power and authority that God has given us, we are not fearful of any demon entering us, just coming and entering into us. No, it doesn't, they can't. 
Yeah. Why do you think that they, they shout and, and scream when we are doing deliverance and run? They're afraid of, of, of what you carry. If you carry Jesus, you carry the fire, they're afraid of you too. So they're not just trying to come and jump into you. <laughs> you know, they're trying to run out of you. <laughs> but it takes us growing in the things of the spirit to get to that place. Yeah, but we are protected. We are covered. We need to just deal with the ones that were already in our bloodlines for most of us, because for most of us as believers who are living right is the in inherited ones that we are trying to get rid of. Because those ones have a legal right that is bigger than what you did. Mm -hmm. Bye, Star. <laughs> Yeah, we're done at this point. I'm just, if, if people have any more questions, fine. If not, I'll just pray and close us and release us. And when it comes to deliverance, we can have a thousand questions. But I'm going to do a few multiple deliverance sessions so that you guys have a good understanding of it. And then we'll pray deliverance. On, not, not this month, in the future. Any other questions before we call it a day or call it a night? Let me see if anybody else posted any questions here. Okay. All right. I don't see any other questions. All right. So that's going to be it for tonight. Thank you all for your patience <laughs> with us while we were teaching. Let us pray. Father God, we just want to bless you for a wonderful time in your presence. God, we come in the name of Jesus to just say, thank you, God. Thank you for your word. That is life. Thank you for your word that is light. God, thank you for the revelation, for the illumination that you have brought upon us here today. Spirit of the living God, I thank you for your presence. I thank you that you are the great teacher. You're the one who <laughs> does all truth. Oh God, I pray God that you will pull down every stronghold in the minds of all your daughters here tonight. If there be any, any wrong beliefs, wrong understanding, wrong perception about deliverance, oh God, about the casting out of devils, God, I just pull it down. I just wash it away with the blood, oh God, that there will be room to receive a revelation and a fresh word from you. God, give us a deep understanding of how you work, oh God, how you set us free. God, empower your daughter so that they can go out there and bring many more God, and bring them Father God, I pray that you will help us to live consecrated lives. Holy Spirit, Amen. you are the one who is our helper. We cannot live consecrated by ourselves. We cannot do it in our own might, God. The slightest thing, we want to get upset, we want to just cheat a little bit here, lie a little bit there, you know, hold a little bit of unforgiveness. God, we try, but we're not able to. Holy Spirit, help us. Help us not to break the hedge of protection that you have put around us, God. Lord, I just pray for a, a higher level of discernment on every woman here at T2, God. That when we encounter those things that are not of you, when we encounter things that we should not be looking at, things that we should not be listening to, God, that foul words will not come out of our mouths, oh God. We will not spew evil out of our mouths. God, but that the well that is within us, God, will be down. Lord, that you live as living water will spring up daily, God. So everything that will be of you. Lord, I pray that you work on our minds. Amen. I pray for the renewing of the minds of every T2 woman. Amen. God, that we will only think those things that are, of, that are pure, those things that are good, those things that are of good report. Those things that are of you, things that we, we, will, we will dwell on in our thoughts. Amen. Lord, I just pray that your blood 
we just fall upon every woman right now at the sound of my voice in their homes. Amen. We have learned today, oh God, that you are a God. But I pray that your fire will fall upon the lives of these women. Amen. That you will begin to consume every remnant of the works of darkness in each of our lives, including myself, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, those things that we inherit in our bloodline, we give you full permission of the living God to begin to go into our foundations and just begin to burn out those things. Let it go. We ask everything that is not of you in our lives. Begin to uproot every tree, oh God, that you did not plant in our life. Even as we go to sleep tonight, God, I pray that you will consume every darkness in our lives. God, that your light will begin to shine into every dark chamber. And I go let the word that has come out today that has gone forth, let it bear fruit in the lives of your daughter. But I pray that you raise powerful warriors amongst these women in your kingdom. So that you teach them those things that I am not even able to teach them. God, those things, the same way that you would just reveal some things to me, God, and I would just know it in my spirit. I pray that you would teach this woman. As they go about their day, teach them as they lay down to sleep at night. Raise them as mighty warriors, oh God. Amen. That the enemy <coughs> will stand them, God. May they all burn continually. <laughs> fire, oh God. Father God, we just thank you. I just seal this word that we have prayed with the blood of Jesus. I seal the word that every seed that has fallen on the soil of our hearts, God, with the blood of Jesus, that the enemy will not steal it from us, but that it will bear fruit. Lord, may your protection rest upon each and every one of these women in this season. May you continue to keep them healthy well oh god lord i just pray for financial blessings upon every woman that is here in this season oh god i pray for better jobs i pray for promotion god i pray for business expansions oh god amongst these women lord give them your, their hearts desires, even as they have sacrificed in this ministry god to serve you to provide for the helpless to provide for the destitute god i pray that you reward them exceedingly abundantly above every desire that they can even possibly have in their hearts oh god lord i pray that you will restore everything that the locust and the canker worm and the palmer worm has eaten from these women oh god in their lives i pray for restoration oh god i like that huh? Oh, thank you. Well, I just thank you. I bless you. I commit each of them into your hands, oh God. Amen. Amen.